symbol of light, symbol of knowledge, symbol of warmth, symbol of freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Happy Sunday, July 19th, 2020. Great that all of you can join us this morning via this unique communication Zoom format. Today is our fourth event in our 2020 Summer Forum Speaker Series. Our fourth speaker is Vicki Bennett. Vicki is the Sustainability Director for Salt Lake City Government. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of California at San Diego and an executive MBA from the University of Utah. Vicki has worked in Salt Lake City government for nearly 20 years. In 2011, Salt Lake City government set a goal of zero waste by the year 2040. And also in 2011, Salt Lake City set a goal of diverting 70% of waste into recycled materials or into recycled compost. But the question remains, what is exactly meant by sustainability? The title of Vicki's presentation is Salt Lake City Government's Sustainability Policies Impacts When Residents Are Staying Home. When she concludes, we will then take one minute, one minute for the offering. We may be meeting virtually, remotely via Zoom, but we are spiritually this morning meeting within the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City, Utah. After the offering, Vicki will be happy to engage in a lively question and answer period until 11 a.m. We'll finish right at 11 o'clock. You all know there's no such thing as a bad question. Please type your questions into the question and answer holding room and I will read them aloud. So Vicki, welcome. This Zoom format is yours. Great, thank you so much, Tim. And thanks everybody for being on this this morning. Um, I personally love Zoom and have spent a large amount of my time on Zoom meetings uh, since Salt Lake City government is now basically working remotely, especially since the uh, earthquake and the city county building is still being repaired. So, you know, we're getting really good at this um, and have learned all of the tricks of the trade and you know, can even find that you can click into somebody's living room and ask them a quick question when you need to. So it's, it's, been, it's been new, but I think it's taught us a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and bring up the slideshow. All right. So, I know, as uh, Tim said, you know, I've been with the city for 20 years and I've been a director of the department since it was formally created 13 years ago. So I hope I have some good background to give you and I'm going to give you a broad overview of some of the issues we're working on and especially some of the equity issues that we're running into right now. Um, so, you know, what is sustainability and how do we start talking about this? Well, sustainability touches the whole city and you know, our department is working on a lot of cross-departmental initiatives and we but at the same time we do directly oversee a number of programs so within our department itself we have food food issues and we work with the community kitchens and a lot of the community gardens we run waste and recycling so we like to say that keeps us grounded every time one of those recycling or garbage trucks goes down the street that's us you know we, we have an important job to do um, we do electric vehicles, uh, clean energy for community municipal buildings, um, energy efficiency. So today we're going to work talk a lot about a lot of those things and then also some of the other things that we, we touch upon too with our partners in the rest of local government. Um, urban forestry, water issues that are run through um, much of the uh, public utilities realm. So. Um, so what is sustainability? Um, that's one of the big questions and it's one of the things that I've always hated having to, e you know, it can't easily be defined. Um, 
I remember one time Mayor Becker was going to the council and he said, well, here's our budget presentation and we're giving you a sustainable budget. And I just wanted to yell, no, 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 don't use that word there. Uh, it's sustainability is you know, quite often looked at as just, okay, it's environmental protection. And that's the most traditional approach of looking at it. But we're taking a lot more holistic approach to it talking about how sustainability is really trying to balance the needs of environment, economic, economy, and then our society. And that definition really is more important as it drives our work forward. But even more importantly now, we've been over the last few years really looking at sustainability from an equity lens. And this is something that we keep in mind with the larger historical compact context of equity and the impacts that we continue to see. <clears throat> like how has our city been shaped by racism, by discrimination? And how can we as a department and helping the rest of the city really work to address these issues? It's not a new concept for those of us working in the sustainability field. So I'm gonna to touch on the work we do that has an equity impact that is really relevant right now as we're talking through this. And you can see it in a lot of different ways. There's different levels of pollution, and you see that areas with lower income population tend to have a lot be affected more. There's differences in the built environment. Uh, quite often there's more concrete, more highways, fewer trees, less access to transportation in lower income communities. And that results in hotter temperatures, could be less access to health care, lower food access to healthy foods. And then we also run into all of the issues of communications barriers with diverse communities. How do we really reach out? Because I can guarantee you, they're not on this Zoom meeting this morning. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a total aside, but it was something we found um, working with a, a professor at Weber State. And this talks shows a little bit of the white population compared to the areas of the city, which is considered desirable, medium desirable, and as you can see, the red, red areas is a less desirable areas. And, you know, this is a, you know, this is a, uh, a scale that's done by some of the uh, population demographers. But if you look at it, the Jordan River, which used to be used as a sewer and refuse dump. So with the Jordan River area used to be considered undesirable for residential development. However, you know, then industry grew around the tracks, worker housing began to pop up, and east side properties were then more preferable. And that's where the more affluent, mostly white population has landed. So as you can see, you know, we have systemic racism that we're working to overcome right in Salt Lake. But before we get into more of that, let's uh, pivot to the present. Let's talk about climate change a little bit. You know, why are we working on it? What can we do to make a difference? Well, it's because the impacts are local. You know, increased risk of wildfire is a really good example. You know, it's happening all over the world. Just in the last year, we've seen wildfires in Australia. Um, last couple of years, major fires in California and in the Amazon. But then right here in Utah, yeah, last month, a few years ago, major wildfires that we're seeing because it's drying out and we're seeing more and more impact due to the warming climate. We also know that the warming climate is causing decreased snowpack and this trend is also going to continue. And this picture was taken in December of 2012 and you can see what should be ski runs covered by snow and that's all we had at the time. And so this is affecting our water supplies and also our $1.4 billion Utah ski industry. So climate change is really affecting our economy too. This is a great chart. This is the average temperature of each decade. And then you can see the stars and each one of the stars is the warmest single year of each decade. And we're starting to get to the point where we're in areas that are totally unrecognizable. And something that, you know, I look at, this is in my lifetime, and it's, you know, if we start plotting the next decade, it's going up even more. So it's something that is really hitting us now, and it's going to continue to increase, which is hard to, can, you know, continually talk about because it is an ongoing issue. 
some of the lesser known changes of climate change are gonna be on public health. So just like we've seen with COVID-19, these impacts are gonna hit our most vulnerable populations harder and local governments have to respond. This makes climate change an equity issue. The causes of climate change are global, but the impact is local. For example, the warming climate is going to increase ozone pollution in the summer. We're going to have more particulate pollution from wildfires in the summer. It's going to increase the heat impact and place a heavier burden on those without cooling systems in their homes, those with underlying health conditions, people who work outside, and those who walk or take public transportation to get around. And then it creates more opportunity for disease. We've already seen how the spread of coronavirus may have ca been caused or amplified by wildlife trade, the loss of habitat, and other environmental ills. What else will we see as we disrupt the climate and the ecosystems? Then in Utah, we all know about air quality. As we've seen, climate change will impact air quality and worsen certain aspects of it. This affects all of us, but again, it hits our most vulnerable populations the most, making it an equity issue. The good news is that things we do to reduce emissions that cause climate change also improve air quality. So for the sustainability department, these areas of work are connected. So now I'll talk about what the city is doing to reduce pollution with the direct tools we have, as well as exerting influence to educate and push for broader pollution reducing behaviors and policies. A few of the things we've implemented for the community and for our internal op operations have been you know, very wide ranging. Of course, for internal operations, we can be stricter and we're looking to model more aggressive sustainable behavior to set an example for other governments, businesses, and individuals. We have the idle free ordinance and that's been something that, you know, we started and now you see many communities around the Valley have out idle free ordinances. <clears throat> We're promoting electric vehicles. In our fleet, we have over 30 all electric vehicles and about 250 hybrid vehicles, plus 200 heavy duty alternative fuel trucks. And we have energy efficient buildings. We have an energy management executive order stipulating that all city buildings should identify and require energy efficiency best practices for all municipal buildings. And new construction should be what we call net zero. And we have the city, the uh, public safety building there, and our two new fire stations are what's called net zero, which means it produces as much energy as it consumes. Mm -hmm. And so it is really important to us to ensure that we can show that this can be done. It can be done in a cost-effective measure and cost-effective manner. And that way other governments and other businesses can see that how beneficial this can be. One of the ways we're looking to drive solutions is by incentivizing electric vehicles in the community. <clears throat> electric vehicles put out zero tailpipe emissions and are found to be cleaner from total carbon emission perspective too, even using the relatively dirtier coal-based electricity that we get it from. <clears throat> we've participated in bulk purchase programs and we've been installing public EV charging stations. We've actually, since 2018, had the charging downtown be free. Here's a snapshot of our EV dashboard. And this is all, just for your reference, all of this is available at our slcgreen.com website. Um, it's, it's worth looking. There's a lot of stuff there that's really interesting to look through. Um, and the EV page specifically has a lot of information and resources on why driving electric can help with air quality, climate, and help you save money. So as you can see, public outreach and education is a large part of our work. We have what's called an energy benchmarking ordinance. And you know, what is that and why is it important? Well, all that it means is it requires large commercial buildings to report what's called their energy star score to the city. So it's a simple process where they put into a program, it's run by the EPA that says, you know, we're using this much electricity and this much natural gas and it, for the size and type of building, it gives them a score from zero to 100. 50 is average, 100 is great. And so that creates transparency by having them report that to us. And it gives us an idea of what the community carbon footprint is. But most importantly, you can't control what you can't measure. 
So the idea is, is if the buildings see energy and cost savings opportunities, they can then take the next step. They can work with their utility partners, Dominion Energy and Rocky Mountain Power, and they have so many options where they can help them with energy efficiency programs quite often at no cost. And there's over, there are about 1,800 buildings that qualify in Salt Lake that we're working with there. <clears throat> Transportation plans and projects are a big way that Salt Lake City is working to improve air quality, increase equity, improve access, and to strengthen livelihoods because cars are expensive, right? So we have the Hive Pass, which is a discounted UTA pass for Salt Lake City residents. We're implementing our first transit master plan. We have the Funding Our Futures um, money now, which is helping with east-west connectivity in town. And we also are doing biking and pedestrian enhancements. Due to the age of our urban forest, for the past two decades, we've had a really hard time keeping up on the amount of trees that we're replacing. And we've actually had to remove more trees than we've planted on a yearly basis. And so much of our urban forest was planted 100 plus years ago. And everyone said, oh, it's great. It's all growing. Well, unfortunately, all of the trees are getting old and dying at the same time. So as a result, the city's urban forest has been contracting in size. So recognizing the many benefits that trees provide and the vital role that the urban forest plays in improving the health and quality of life for city residents, the city council has steadily and substantially increased funding for tree planting over the last five years. So over the last three years, we've basically broken even. We've been able to plant as many trees as have been dying, but we still really want to increase the size. So in 2020, Mayor and Mayor Mendenhall has made it a priority to plant an additional 1,000 trees on the west side each year. So it's not only to significantly increase the tree canopy, it's going to result in meaningful expansion of our urban forest. And you know, this is more than just symbolic environmental action. Trees help clear the air, they improve neighborhood livability, they reduce urban heat island effect, filter and control stormwater, and service habitats for birds and species. So, so many different reasons that we want to increase the number of trees in our city. <clears throat> and any of, anyone can help if you're in Salt Lake City and you have adequate space in your park strip, or even if it's in your front yard, if your park strip is too small, you know, the urban forester will provide you a tree and they will help you with the uh, watering needs, you know, telling you what you need to do. So if, if you agree to water your tree, you can get a new one if you need it. So it's uh, the, the program's there for everyone to use. Um, moving on to renewable energy, <clears throat> one of the biggest ways the city and the department's working to reduce emissions and mitigate climate change is through our work on renewable energy. We've added solar to over a dozen municipal buildings. This is the rooftop of the public safety building. We really do love wandering around on roofs full of solar panels. It, it's so much fun. Um, our latest project was a 360 panel array at the Sorensen campus in Glendale, and that started churning out electricity last month. But we're also working on systems to drive development of cleaner energy for the entire community. So in 2016, Salt Lake City became the 16th city in the nation to make a 100% clean energy commitment. So our goals are 50% municipal energy use powered by clean energy by 2020. We're in the final stages of negotiating on this. Um, actually, we're not gonna make 2020, but the good news is it's gonna be 2022. And with the size of the solar array we have negotiated right now, it looks like we'll be at 85 to 90%. So we figured the couple year delay in the project was more than worth the payback there. And then we have our goal of 100% community electricity sourced from renewable energy by 2030. So after the joint resolutions, we've been able to uh, work on with uh, Rocky Mountain Power and really uh, move forward on a regional basis. It's been, it's been uh, a really good partnership and we have what we call our clean energy implementation, implementation plan now that we update with them each spring. Covers four major focus areas. 
In each case, the plan ex details existing opportunities and programs offered by the utility, along with the city's desire to accelerate progress in all four areas. <clears throat> Some of the near-term items not even related to 100% renewable energy are that we're working with them on the benchmarking program, and they've helped automate that for us. We've been working with them on low-income residential energy efficiency, and also on the electric vehicle infrastructure. You know, as you can imagine, the electric company really would like to sell more electricity and they are a great partnership, when, have a great partnership when it comes to electrified transportation offerings. <clears throat> this was our biggest achievement at reaching our goals is when we had the, what was called HB 411, two years ago signed by the governor, we passed through the legislature and that is the, law that allows us to move forward with our 100% community clean energy and negotiate with Rocky Mountain Power on that. Um, that was quite the process to get it through. And as you can imagine, having the legislature understand the importance of that to us and how we can make it work so it's fair to all. Part of the uh, HB 411 requirements was that any community, not just Salt Lake City, and it was Park City who was um, you can see in the picture that's Mayor Bierman from Park City and Mayor Biskupski from Salt Lake. Um, Steve Handy was the uh, representative that sponsored this for us. And it was something where we said, well, we want all communities to be able to be part of this. And so the process that was being followed was any community that wanted to have be part, they had to pass a resolution by the end of 2019. Well, Rocky Mountain Power thought, ah, okay, we might get one more. Yeah. Well, surprise, we had, we had 24. Unfortunately, one actually wasn't a, an eligible community. So it is 23 Utah cities are participating up and down the Wasatch Front, uh, all the way to Moab, Springdale. They are all pledging to be part of this and use 100% renewable energy by 2030 and work with Rocky Mountain Power to meet these goals. So we're now working on a governance agreement with all of these cities that we can take to the Public Service Commission. As I mentioned, we're also working on energy efficiency, particularly on west side communities. You know, so a lot of these inequities we talked about, well, we've got economic disparities between the east and west sides. We know there's lower quality of life indicators on the west side of town. So we really are looking for simple ways that we can help. And one of those is to help with energy efficiency measures, simple things like helping them change light bulbs to LEDs, adjusting their thermostats that can help households save money, homes be more comfortable and help reduce pollution. Um, and we've really found success reaching out to new pockets of the population, helping working with International Rescue Committee, Salt Lake City or County Aging Services, some of the other programs and it's helped us reach some of the communities that we've had a hard time being able to reach in the past. Um, and you can learn a lot more about all of these initiatives, like I said, on slcgreen.com. This is our Climate Positive 2040 webpage and it has specific energy and pollution reduction goals that I've described today. We're also really committed to the importance of expanding our influence in our network. The Utah Climate Action Network is a uh, group that we helped found working with uh, Utah Clean Energy, one of our nonprofit partners. And this is a group of businesses, municipalities, nonprofits, religious organizations working to see what we can accomplish more than just what we would do individually and you know, building on each other's strengths. <clears throat> I'm going to talk briefly about water, which is now we do not directly manage this. This is something that's done through the Public Utilities Department, but they are a very close ally in everything we do. And rest be sure they are watching climate issues in everything they do, all of their plans. They are fully aware of the issues we have there. I mean, water largely comes from the mountains, and climate change is impacting the amount of water we have when it runs off, and then even its quality. We found that with every degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, we can expect to see close to a 4% average decrease in overall water volume. So 
this is impacting the, the algae blooms that we hear about, agricultural water supply is threatened. Um, sometimes we're having to divert culinary water because the agricultural water has the algae bloom, we can't use it. Um, and then just drought in general. And you know, so we've got lack of water, water that's not, you know, we don't have enough snowpack, so it's not melting at the right time of year. And we then are getting some major flooding events. You know, a couple of years ago in 2017, we had two 200 year floods and you know, the Sprague Library is still closed. It flooded schools. So public utilities is really busy looking at how, how to handle climate impacts. What you can do, you know, while you're home, what you're, as you're, you know, want to participate in all of this, just, you know, a general list of things. And again, looking at the public utilities website has so many ideas. They have plant lists, they have you know, all of your basic ideas of when to water, how to plant, you know, group your plants so you're only watering what you need to. You know, they're not totally against grass. They say small amount of grass watered properly is just fine, but, you know, don't overwater it. And they have a whole list of ideas on how to mow and how to weed and how to mulch. So, um, also another place I really recommend since you're all Zoom leader users, I'm going to make the assumption you'll all be able to take a look at the public utilities website and see all of their ideas on um, yeah. indoors, fixing leaky toilets, um, looking at water sense, appliances. Again, I won't go through all the details, but they have so many things there for you. It's, it's really useful. So um, conservation is, use, is really working, you know, in the last 18 years total water use has total has declined the peak demand how much we need on the hottest day of the year has declined but you know we have to size our systems for those peak days so it's just as important to you know not water when it's super hot try and spread your water use out and try and limit our peak demand um, but we still have we still are using more water on average than other arid cities. So there's still a lot more that we can do. So, you know, just kind of summarizing all of this is you know the role of local government and where we are and the types of things we work on. I, I mean, I haven't even touched really a lot of our recycling programs. That's something that's still going on. Um, we have food programs that we're working on and looking to even help with food security in the midst of this pandemic for people who are losing their jobs. And, you know, it, it's so broad. You know, what we're really trying to do is respond to community needs. We provide services. We're suddenly in the middle of disaster response. We're coordinating with other levels of government, not just within the city, but we work with the county and the state closely. We really try to provide all the information needed, you know, and get input from the community members, find out what you want us to do. And, you know, we're always happy to get emails and ideas and see what other things could be going, happening because we're just, you know, one group of people who are doing our best to try and think through everything. We want to mitigate the contributing factors leading to risk and inequity, you know, be it pollution, drought, you know, try and lower the amount of ozone, reduce reliance on cars in all ways, uh, promote water conservation, protect our watershed, strengthen our infrastructure, reduce pollution due to climate, you know, and climate change. Look at the really long-term goals. We've worked with the state on the uh, Gardner Institute, put out their climate roadmap, and we were very influential in pushing some really strong goals there that uh, was then delivered to the legislature because we feel it's just so important. Um, we want to make connections on all of the interconnected issues between internal departments, external agencies, you know, nonprofits, businesses, community partners, and advocate for solutions at the highest level of government because we know that you know, all of the impacts are felt locally and the impacts are paid for by us, the local taxpayers. So we live in a time of tremendous importance and we love this haiku that we found written by a uh, researcher at NOAA. 
you know, it's, it's so important now for us to take action, but we really have to look at it as an opportunity as it relates to our shared future on this climate. Um, this haiku suggests our actions shape things 40 years out, but in reality, we're looking at centuries or millennia, depending on the trajectory we take right now. What do we do to limit climate change? And how do we move the needle? You know, best answers and solutions are crafted locally by people like you, everyone on the webinar today. Hopefully I've shared some examples that, from Salt Lake City that might prove well relevant and I really welcome any questions now and turn it back over to Tim. Okay. And Vicki, thank you. We're gonna take one minute, one minute for the offering. So for all of all, everybody participating here, if you'll take time now to uh, con uh, consider contributing to the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City, we'll take one minute and then we'll go to questions. Okay, we're back, Vicki, and uh, have a number of questions here. So uh, uh, we'll present them and, and uh, hopefully with quick answers, we'll be able to uh, get them all in. First one is uh, Salt Lake City is Utah's first city, capital city, largest city with a population we think at night of over 200,000. It's over 170 years old and maybe a, at noon on a weekday, the population may swell to as large as 600,000. Uh, therefore, is its aging infrastructure adequate today to, to handle a growing urban population? I think we're like any city, no. <laughs> and we're, we're at the point right now where, you know, we, we have the funding our future money, which was that 1% sales tax increase. And that is being used for more infrastructure projects. And if you look at the number of streets projects going on right now, it's much more than has been in the past few years. Uh, we, like most other cities, really fell behind during the 2009 recession. And for about two, three years, we did almost no, other than emergency maintenance, we did almost zero. And that is where, again, most cities really have now the catch up to do. Um, but we are, um, I think our water is probably in the best bet or best shape because public utilities has been able to continually fund for that. We've got a giant new reclamation plant being built um, and then streets we're trying to catch up on, but it is going to be an ongoing effort. Okay. Water, you mentioned water. Uh, Utah is the second driest state after Nevada. Uh, water is a definite concern. Uh, uh, what more can Salt Lake City uh, do to conserve water? I'm thinking, for example, uh, desalinization plants like we see in California and Israel. Uh, could that be a possibility as well? Well, specifically on desalinization, that's expensive, really expensive. And we still do have the uh, water from the snowpack. Luckily, that is, you know, we, we're still getting enough. Most likely what we'll be doing is looking at groundwater as we lose some of the snowpack long term. And we could even, you know, we, we think we're going to get as much liquid from the sky, but be it coming in rain or snow, that's the hard part. You know, we're not sure which, but if it comes in rain, still comes down the mountain, we could even do some um, aquifer recharging and then be able to pump from groundwater later. So those are some of the things that um, public utilities is thinking about. And then for individuals, everything that people can do to minimize the amount of water that they need on their lawns. And we probably have to start looking at in you know, a long term, how we encourage more planting, which we're doing now, 
we do have a drought management plan that if we really reduce the amount of water in our reservoirs low enough, we can start mandating people just not water, which you know, we don't want to do, but you know, we've got those, those plans there in just in case. Just in case. You mentioned earlier that, so that, that the city is partnering with, with the county and with the state. How about the University of Utah, which is entirely within Salt Lake City, and at the University of Utah, if it were a city, would be the seventh largest city in the state uh, as a research tool, but also as a partner. Uh, what is the city doing with the University of Utah? Uh, we work with them closely. Um, I've had great connections with their past and current sustainability director, people that, you know, we pick up the phone and talk to each other probably every week or two about what's going on. The University of Utah has its own carbon reduction goals and you know, goal to be zero, net zero themselves. And they are close partners in so many things we're doing. And one of the things that we are running into, you know, which we'd love to see them do is to try and limit the amount of uh, grass that's up there. But again, then you've got the issue of the long-term cost of even, or the you know, short-term cost of making that change. And so that's probably what change, you know, limits some people from actually doing that. But eventually we'll get there. Yeah. Water. You mentioned earlier with people being home uh, in considerable numbers the last five months, uh, cultivating gardens, home gardens, uh, let's say urban farming. And are community gardens helping those struggling with food insecurity? They are. We've got some great community gardens on the west side, um, and we could use more. We partner with Wasatch Community Gardens. They manage them for us. And there's still um, there's a waiting list for community garden space. But wow. we have been doing that, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, if and when this virus ever does leave us, uh, do we hope to be able to improve air quality? Because, and we noticed that in the last five months, amazingly and surprisingly, with fewer people uh, polluting the air with tailpipes, we've seen air quality in the Salt Lake Valley be uh, just amazingly clean compared to past years. You mentioned the use of electric cars. Can we, can, uh, are electric vehicles, to what extent are they really sustainable in terms of uh, contributing to air quality? Uh, well, they're, the best thing about electric vehicles is that they're moving from, you know, by having an electric vehicle, you're able to have localized air emissions be zero. Now, you know, if you look at it from a broader point of view, yes, you're still getting electricity from, you know, a, a coal, at least some portion of it from a coal-fired power plant. But if you're like me, you know, we uh, like to take the you know, I, I like to plug my electric vehicle in at home and then I can at least say, well, it is from solar power and we're able to uh, have less emissions there. You know, and I think, you know, as we're talking about the pandemic, something that's really interesting, like we said, we've seen the lesser air quality effects. And now a lot of places are starting to talk about return to work plans. And the city did its initial one, and I took one look at it and said, well, we got to, you know, the first thought was, okay, who can go back and when and what's safe? And I threw it right back at them, and I said, no, the, the uh, approach is wrong. It's like, who has to go back? Why do I have to be at, in the office? Why can't they continue working at home? And why don't we make it so they don't have to commute at all? And the mayor's, when she got it, she says, well, of course. So if we can come up with a really aggressive telecommuting process for city, um, for city employees and show that to other businesses, I think that's gonna get us a long ways, yeah. Uh, with more electric vehicles predicted, maybe uh, more than gas fuel in the next decade or so, would we have more power stations uh, in Salt Lake City? Um, Electric vehicle power stations, yes, definitely. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power has had a lot of funding to put more in. We've been working with them. And that's something where, you know, it's always the chicken and the egg. We're trying to have the right amount of electric vehicle stations compared to the right amount of cars that are on the road. And I think we've got a good mix right now, but we do want more. Um, a lot of the emphasis 
has been on the fast charging stations up and down the interstates because people often don't buy an electric vehicle because they can't drive it to, you know, they, they want to go visit relatives in St. George and how do they do that? So Rocky Mountain Power has put in a series of charging stations all the way up and down I-15 to ensure that people can use them outside the city. Okay. Fact is the majority of, of people still are driving gas-fueled cars and uh, the governor and legislators have talked about tier three or T3 um, be used. Would that also help air quality in Salt Lake City as we make this transition towards electric vehicles? Immensely, yeah. The tier three, the newer vehicles and then tier three gasoline reduce the amount of emissions to the extent of, you know, if you compare it over the last few years, almost by 90%. It is just remarkable what it does. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, we'd rather be able to get people on a good transit system, get them used to that. Um, and that's so hard now because if you look at where we are with the COVID and the pandemic, people don't want to get on the bus and I don't blame them. And you know? so we're going to have to get set, get back to the point where people are comfortable being at least in small numbers of others, like when you're on, a, on transit. Um. What you mentioned, uh, the transportation department, could Salt Lake City benefit with more one-way streets uh, in downtown in order to maybe save the burning of gasoline? And that one, I am just not an expert on. I know that the one-way streets are the one place that we do have a better chance to have all of the stoplights coordinated. And I know that that's something that they have constantly looked at the biggest issue we run into is the fact that our streets are so wide, we have to have longer lights so people can walk across them. And that's our, our uh, biggest problem when it comes to how we can time lights and make things a little bit more efficient. But um, I would probably have to defer to them for the technicalities behind that. Okay. I have a question from Susan Dyer uh, who says, I'm a Prius driver. And until recently, I was able to park for free in Salt Lake City. Now, that is no longer the case. I thought that was an excellent incentive for low carbon cars. What was the city's thinking in taking away that incentive? Well, the, here's the situation. And I, I fully understand her, her concern there. Um, when we first gave electric vehicle, again, it was transportation um, put in the process, the, uh, program where efficient cars were able to park for free. And when this first started, it's been, boy, about 10 years, the most efficient cars we rated on the EPA efficiency scale, they have everything is from zero to 10. And we said, <clears throat> okay, if it's an eight, nine or a 10, you can park for free. There were a hundred different car models that qualified. And we thought, okay, then people will get the most efficient type of car. Well, cars got more efficient. And so then we got to the point where I have a Subaru, our, our second car is a Subaru Outback that we use for longer trips. It rated an eight. I could have gotten free parking for that. Suddenly we're at the point where everybody's getting free parking. We had over a thousand different vehicle types eligible and we've lost the incentive. So transportation looked at the options and decided that you know, to use a, a different process that got us back to like the hundred most efficient. And so most of your gas engine vehicles really don't qualify anymore. There's just very few that do. Okay. <laughs> Salt Lake City is becoming a large city. Uh, the plans are looking in the next 10 years or so that uh, there'll be five or six high rise buildings and hotels planned. And thinking visionary with the goal of you know, trying to get people out of their cars when they come downtown, could a multi-block pedestrian mall be created to link, say, the gateway with the City Creek area? As they are developing all of these areas, one of the things that's an incentive for the developers is to put various sorts of mid-block crossways in. And in most cases, it's now being required. Um, and of course, each block is a little different and some of them are already developed, so we can't do anything about it. But the new developments do require some sort of green space and some sort of mid block access because our blocks are just too big. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, well, a number of questions deal with something called the inland port. 
Uh, My which, favorite problem. That's <laughs> right. So uh, in a very gentle way, I'm going to pose that question to you, something the, uh, the legislature uh, uh, did back uh, almost two years ago. But uh, I know that this concept was being discussed 40 years ago. So uh, uh, with regard to sustainability, uh, the inland port. Right. And it is so frustrating, as I'm sure most people on the uh, on this call know, Salt Lake City doesn't have control like we would want to have because of the legislature's actions. Um, that said, they are, you know, we are pushing constantly. Of course, there is still a lawsuit out there and, you know, I don't know, it's it, there. We lost the initial lawsuit. It's being challenged again. So I, you know, I don't know how long that will take for us to have any closure, but um, the state is <clears throat> still trying to, you know, be the ones running it and they have the Inland Port Authority. I, I guess trying to look at a silver lining, <clears throat> the director, Jack Hedge, actually comes from an inland port that was extremely um, green and has sustainable practice knowledge and that, those ideas in mind. But that said, he needs the funding to do it and he's going to need to be allowed to do that. Um, we've done a lot of work reviewing what's been said in their business plan, making the comments. I told him that you got to have a sustainability director at the Inland Port. He said he's going to. Um, but even he and the Inland Port Authority have only so much sway over whatever's done because these are private landowners and they're going to sell to whoever they want. Those people can develop according to current zoning laws. And I don't see the legislature coming in and saying, you have to do something different than what's done in the rest of the city. Um, so it's one of those, I, I don't wanna say wait and see because we are still in trying to pressure them constantly, but the amount of influence we have is yet to be seen and it, it concerns us all. So that's, yeah, it really does, yeah. Recycling question. Uh, Jim Caetano, uh, Mark Rothacker both asked about plastics and we know plastic comes in different forms and uh, I'm one of those folks who have uh, four different containers with the city. And so the question is, could there be a fifth that would make a more distinguishing uh, differentiation in terms of plastics that could be recycled to achieve the city's goal uh, by 2040, if not earlier, with regard to uh, recycling? Most of our plastics are being recycled now. And of course, what we're trying to do is, again, it's a balance. You know, like you say, we've got, you know, those of us who do also have the glass containers, four containers. Every one of those containers is a truck driving down the street. So you have pollution issues, you have fuel use issues. So we want to get everything into as few containers as possible, which is why we've been lucky to have a good single stream recycling program. Um, we only have about a couple percent of our total recycling stream be plastics that are less recyclables, what they call the three through seven. Your ones and twos are your big milk jugs, laundry jugs, things, those are easily recyclable. The other types of plastic that aren't as recyclable, right now uh, we're working with waste management who's our recycling um, company and they're finding a way where we can take more of those out. Now we're down to probably a percent or two that we will be looking for a way to, to use. So at this point, it's not a big enough number to warrant more collection effort. Okay. Yeah. Living in Salt Lake City, one can see just an astronomical number of new buildings going up that are uh, apartments and condominiums especially along the tracks routes that we see. There are a number of questions that deal with uh, housing uh, and, the, and buildings and the environment. Um, does the city have the moral suasion, if not the legal authority, to require these new condo units, new apartment buildings, really all new buildings, to meet LEED standards, uh, uh, the, the uh, leadership in energy and environmental design standards? Uh, unfortunately, no. 
And this is something where if anybody would want to start being involved in what goes on at the legislature and how the uh, energy codes are set, that is something that you know we really are constantly pushing. Um, most of the I'd say majority of the people in the legislature are developers of some sort or home builders, and they do not want any more regulation than they possibly, you know, than they have to. And then their other reasoning is, is they don't want different regulations between different cities. So we have no control over the energy code. That is purely at the state level. Um, I will have a, a small caveat. If we would petition them for a, a, any exceptions, we could ask, but it's the same group that sets the energy code that is generally not as strong as any of us would like it to be. And so you know, there's not gonna be exceptions made. We will incentivize in ways. We're working with our redevelopment agency. Can we provide lower cost loans to buildings that are meeting better energy and energy efficiency levels if they're meeting LEED? And so it is something that we try and incentivize, but we cannot require legally. Um, Salt Lake City has many people who are homeless. And there are several questions here that deal with homelessness. And of course, the cost of housing and the cost of, of rental units. And so uh, uh, we know that Salt Lake City has encouraged the construction of more accessory dwelling units, ADUs, uh, because of the increase in population, aging population. Or accessory dwelling units uh, allowing Salt Lake City to become more sustainable. They are one small step, yes. And we would love to see more of them. I mean, we've got the ADUs. We've obviously, as uh, the apartments are being built, we're trying to work with developers and provide incentives or even extra financing so they put in some more low in, you know, lower cost units for people who can't afford full market rate. Uh, it's it's a uh, another one of those long term projects that is going to take a lot of incentives on our part to make it work. That's right. This terrible virus has impacted everything uh, that we do, education, business, uh, politics, campaigning. The mayor's goal is a goal of 4,000 new trees within the next four years. Um, has this virus slowed down the process for 1,000 new trees each year on the west side of Salt Lake City that's been historically neglected? Uh, yeah, uh, no, it is not. That's the good news is, you know, that's something that we are able to continue and the city council kept that in the budget. So we are still doing the tree planting and, you know, luckily being an outdoor activity, it's not being slowed by the virus. So we will be continuing the, uh, the tree planting process. And will these trees be uh, trees that are uh, uh, friendly to the population, not Russian olive trees, not box elder trees? Yes, I, again, it's, it's interesting. If you, if you want to look on the forestry website, they have a list of trees that they recommend and they will ensure, they look at the size of the park strip, they look at, you know, of course, they'll always talk to the homeowner and say, what, you know, here's your choices, here's, here's what we recommend. But it is uh, something that is carefully vetted because one of the problems we run into, uh, you'll notice, especially, you know, you go down the beautiful tree-lined streets, especially in some of the eastern part of the city, every tree is the same. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem we have is if one tree gets a disease and it spreads to the rest of the trees, you could lose an entire area of trees to some disease at the same time. So we're trying to diversify more, make it so it isn't this monoculture that was kind of popular when these trees were first planted 100 years ago. That's right. Salt Lake City, until the last few years, had a policy of an annual garbage pickup, roadside pickup. Uh, that was changed, so that now you have to call and make a reservation and so forth. Uh, I've heard a number of critics uh, of that change in policy. Will the city uh, consider returning to the traditional uh, annual one time a year pickup? We're looking at that right now. We're working with the mayor. We're, you know, as, as with any program, things can be, you know, we see what works and what doesn't. Um, we found that some people just don't want to call. Uh, we're thinking there may be an equity issue there because some people feel bad, you know, just worried about calling government. 
At the same time, we've been talking to some council members who are very adamant that they don't want to see piles of garbage up and down blocks again in large quantities because it's a stormwater issue, it's a pollution issue. So we're looking to see if what chain either improvements we could make to the call to hall or where we could have some sort of a schedule that we set that people will be aware of. Or we could even do like some cities do where we do a monthly pickup and people could look could just know that the first Tuesday of every month is the day they could put a bulky item out. And if it's in something like that, it might be more effective. They know when it is and the quantities wouldn't be as big. So that's a uh, work in progress. Um, again, it's a so there's a little bit of an east-west issue there because people on the west side of town don't want to, they were hit with a lot of illegal dumping during the old neighborhood cleanup and they do not want to see this. Whereas the people on the uh, east side of town, you know, they're saying perhaps there could be something more along those lines. So uh, more to come. We're, we're gonna, you know, any program can be improved and we're always happy to work on ways to do that. That's true. Pollution comes in different forms. There are a couple of questions here about light pollution, excessive light uh, with uh, uh, city lights that are beamed upward. Why not have them beam more or less horizontally or toward the ground? Uh, Public Utilities runs our, uh, our lighting and I know that they've put, as they've been putting in new lights, we are working on the light pollution issue. Uh, we don't have any control again over what specific businesses do. Uh, nothing drives me crazier than to drive through the city at night and see some of these places all lit up because they feel like, I don't know if they think it's a security issue or what, but uh, it's an education issue. But for city lights, we are working to ensure that as we build new or replace that we do the down lighting. Okay. We have more questions, but we, we don't have more time, Vicki. But I want to give you a, a minute or so if there's anything you want to say in summary, uh, something not mentioned before, something in response generically to these questions for all of us. Well, I guess the uh, main thing to say is, well, thank you all for taking your time this morning and being on this, uh, this video conference. We really do want to get ideas from people. We're always happy to talk to people and see what ideas that they may have. One of the main things we want to do as a department is ensure that we reflect the values of our city and that we are doing things that really help our city residents to live more sustainable lives. It's a lot of outreach. It's a lot harder right now. We can't go to the city park and stand there at the, or be at the farmer's market and talk to people. So, you know, anytime that you need any ideas or if you're having an event we have people you know be it virtual or whatever we do have people can come and talk because you know communication is the number one thing that's going to keep us moving forward. That's right when we talked about uh, this date back in December uh, we were unaware of an earthquake on March 18th or this terrible virus uh, uh, and so forth so we've just tried to find creative ways to continue to address the, the needs of the city so Thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you very much. And uh, as we close, a quick reminder about next week, July 26th, Sunday next week, uh, Kenna Monruzu Ruha will be our fifth summer forum speaker. Uh, Kenna is outreach coordinator for Westminster College. Uh, it's a community writing center. She's also a facilitator for the YWCA's Woke Words Project and a doctoral student in writing and rhetorical studies at the University of Utah. The title of Kenna's presentation will be Black Women's Perspectives, What It Feels Like. Please join us next Sunday, July 26th. And in the meantime, keep thinking critically. Keep asking the hard questions. Please stay healthy and safe. Please be well and go in peace.